last TED Talker will be Tim White. He's from Hopkins Brain Station. He's going to be talking to us about impacts of shark finning, ecological, genetic, and social perspectives. All right, well, um, for changing the slide, just press the button here. Yeah. All right. She gave the intro. I'm here to talk about the suite of factors that lead to and result from shark finning in the Central Pacific Ocean. This is a huge, 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 and really complex problem as far as why is this activity occurring and what are the implications of it. The largest shark fin bust in the United States uh, included the shark fins from 30,000 separate individual sharks. The scale of this problem is massive. Few species could sustain that type of fishing pressure, least of all sharks which have, which have really, really slow life history strategies, late maturity, low fecundity. Uh, shark finning is currently federally illegal in the United States. The activity of shark finning is, but the sale, trade, and consumption of shark finning is only illegal in a handful of states uh, because the legality around that and opinions of it are still conflicting and difficult. This is a collection of headlines just from the last week that I've taken here. So just in the last week, shark finning is still a very relevant issue. Uh, only five states or so have actually passed state bans on the sale and trade of shark finning. Hawaii was one of them, and then NOAA tried to sue them because uh, they thought it might have been a federal power versus a state power scenario. So even with our, in our <coughs> borders, this is still very much so a complicated issue. American Airlines, just on April 8th of this month, uh, was actually caught shipping the fins of 3,000 sharks through the United States on route to Asia. Uh, and my field work for all this occurs in the Central Pacific Ocean, but I wanted to include this now to kind of set the context that, you know, it's really easy to see uh, shark finners and shark finning happening and put a lot of blame on the fishermen. But what I'm really trying to drive home is that this is a problem that uh, is way beyond the activities of the fishermen and is much more representative of really huge economic and educational differences between those places and a really unfair concentration of wealth that's driving this desperate behavior. So I try to look at this concept and this problem from that lens. The transformation that I would like to see happen is the current shark fisheries as they are today to a more sustainable fisheries focused again on substance and survival. Uh, and today I'll be telling the tale of a few more minor transformations. One of them was physical within myself. And I went from this gentleman to that savage in a few months of field work in the Central Pacific Ocean in a country called Kiribati. So in order to really understand the drivers of shark fitting, the reasons why it's happening, both economic, caloric, ecological, uh, I hopped on a boat and went to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Kiribati was a country I had never heard of until I applied for a job there, and so don't be ashamed if you don't know of its existence. A few people do, although a few in this crowd have mentioned it. Uh, so the island I went to is called Terena. It is only about eight square kilometers, smack dab in the middle of the Pacific, sitting on the equator, about 1,100 miles south of Hawaii, and it is an incredibly traditional place. So it has about 1,800 inhabitants, and just about everyone lives in coconut built huts just like this. No electricity, no running water, no doctors, uh, really no education, and no choice for survival but to take nutrients from the sea. So every single person on this island is incredibly reliant on marine resources just for basic survival. And that's why this was a particularly interesting place for us to study the impacts of shark finning because fisheries collapse in California would be a very, very damaging thing from an ecological and an economic standpoint, and people would be unemployed, but they would survive. In a setting like this, fisheries collapse means the death of a nation, because they're just that intricately linked with it. So, the beginning part of this little TED talk is uh, about the adventure of that process of being a employee of a university one day and then hopping on a sailboat the next day and trying to land somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Uh, I flew into a place called Christmas Island, which was the closest airport to the island that I was headed to, and then I hopped on that ship that you see there, which was just a random 115-foot cargo sailor that happened to be moving through the area. And after a few emails, a phone call, and meeting the guys on the dock, 
they agreed to pretty much ship me for a week at sea from where I was to where I had to be, uh, which made for a very interesting field work experience, of course. Uh, this boat actually dropped me off the island I went to in June, and then it was the last ship that I saw until September when that same ship came back, and I was very, very happy to see him. This is one of the more uh, luxury features of that boat. This is the log flume, aka the head, aka the toilet. Uh, and if you were really lucky, there was big swells that day, and so it was a combo toilet bidet, if you really timed it right. Uh, it was a pretty rustic experience, but one I was happy to have. This is one of the more uh, exciting and fear-inducing photos for me to see still. This photo was taken right about as I'm standing on the shores of this island. Right up top is that ship that took me along, and those th four action packers and a surfboard was pretty much my contents for those few months. Uh, and this is how it all started off. When I got to the shores of this island, uh, there had pretty much been no non-islander to have spent time there for decades. So they're pretty surprised to see me there. And you know, there really wasn't any housing, of course, or any type of setup for something like this. It's, everyone's living in huts. So what do you do but build a hut? <laughs> so step one was to get a place to live. And the people there were amazing with helping me not die. So these, <laughs> this is the women showing me how to weave a roof for the hut that I would eventually live in for that duration. Uh, pretty fun process, pretty easy once you uh, get some tips from women who've been weaving huts for their whole life. So that was a fun experience. I think the construction of these huts is really, really cool. They even use every single thing they use for survival in all of their lives comes locally which is something that's really impressive and something that uh, I wish I could strive for to do myself more personally. But even the twine and the string that was used to hold logs and strings together comes from weaving together pieces of coconut husk that the women would spend hours and hours and hours to get, you know, maybe six feet of this woven line and then that would support the entirety of the hut. I was a happy fellow once it was all said and done. And another benefit of this experience for trying to understand the magnitude and the drivers of shark finning uh, was that during that field phase period, there was no choice but to live very similarly to them for just a brief stint of time. And when the fishing was good uh, and the resources made themselves available, we got the delicious tuna every night, which was a, uh, of course, a treat. It's just the freshest sushi you could ever get is when you catch in the hand line that morning and then eat for lunch. But I got to understand some of the problems of the experience as well. So if there's storms on that island that day, and if the boats can't make it out to fish, there is only a small, pretty, disgusting pool of fresh water in the center of the atoll that harbors a whole bunch of these freshwater eels. So when the seas are too rough and you can't get out to the ocean, you're pretty much eating an eel for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that day. And though the experience of eating eel for days on end was not favorable, um, it did give me insight into some of the actual challenges that these people are facing that would make them resort to such a destructive fishing strategy. So now the science part. The reason I was there uh, in the first place. We tried to understand the shark fishery from three main angles. One of those was ecological in the terms of fisheries monitoring, catch assessment. The second one was genetic in terms of actually looking at the dried shark fins that the fishermen had stored, running genetic analysis on them in order to identify which species were impacted the most strongly by these fisheries. And the third of three uh, was a social component where a lot of my time was spent talking with these fishermen, doing interviews to get a sense for all the questions I've been talking about so far. So here's me measuring a shark that the fisherman had caught that day uh, aside a whole pool of skipjack tuna and mahi-mahi and yellowfin tuna. Most mornings would start with me waking up at sunrise, having my little sea bag with the GPS and a bunch of uh, field notes and some measurement tools and then just scurrying my way around the island until I saw a boat that looked like it was ready to go and looked like they wouldn't mind uh, guy with a beard tagging along for uh, the day, and then I would go out with them and observe which fishing strategies were the most effective. So for each different fishing strategy, I was calculating CPUE or catch per unit effort 
So in order to put that shark fishery in context, we'd be seeing what's the relative return of shark fishing compared to tuna fishing, or fishing for reef sharks, or uh, doing some terrestrial harvesting. To understand the caloric or the biological motivations for the fishery, Here's me uh, coming back from a successful eel hunt with a villager there who has eels in his left hand, coconuts in his right hand, and that pretty much runs the entire island on days where it's stormy out, like today. These are those social interviews I was describing there uh, to get a sense for how commonly did different fishing strategies occur, how many times per week did they go shark finning, how many times per week did they go tuna fishing, uh, what were the reasons why they might decide for one fishing strategy versus another? And this is the, the one graph I'll show, since TED Talks are supposed to be uh, sexier than axes and numbers and stuff. But this is the one that I wanted to put up to show the results of some of those interviews and some of those surveys, uh, where the red dots are the numbers of shark landed per trip, as reported by the fishermen and the blue line is the number of motor boats that were on the island. So what this graph is meant to show here is that there's been a very consistent decline in the number of reported sharks per trip, uh, and it really corresponds well with a increase in motor boats on the island. So around the year 2000 or 2003, all the fishermen reported that uh, the price of shark fins rose and then that news reached the island around that time period where these are fishermen who the average income on the island is zero dollars per year most people don't have any type of uh, cash economy influence to their lives and even nationally for the whole nation the average income is eighteen hundred dollars per year uh, and then all of a sudden shark fins became worth up to hundred and fifty dollars per kilogram so the incentive that global market forces have put on their local commodity really, really, really altered their millennia-long relationship with those natural resources, uh, and absolutely for the worst. But it's important to keep in mind all players involved in that. These are some shark fins. This is their pretty typical process of uh, drying and trying to sell shark fins. So they'll catch a shark that day, chop off its fins, and then they'll dry it out in that strong tropical sun alongside some coconuts and eventually hope to sell both dried coconuts and dried shark fins to whatever ship happens to be passing by. Because that is the method of storage that they use where each shark fisherman had under his hut a huge bag full of shark fins, it let us do a lot of genetic sampling to get a sense for what sharks are actually being captured by this fishery and which are uh, maybe in highest need of conservation focus. A lot of these small-scale shark fisheries really exploded across the Pacific Ocean in the 2000s when the price of fins jacked through the roof. And <coughs> because they've very recently expanded, even basic questions like what types of sharks are actually being caught, we weren't sure about. So after they caught sharks, uh, or with their dried shark fins, I would go around, collect a tiny sample, and then ship it off for genetic identification. This gave us a sense uh, that actually reef sharks and coastal species are very much so disproportionately caught in these small-scale shark fisheries, which totally makes sense given just proximity, but it also could have been the opposite in case they were further offshore fishing for tuna or using different strategies. So what we learned here was that these coastal shark species, black tip reef sharks, white tip reef sharks, gray reef sharks, uh, were really at the highest risk, and those populations were actually very depressed on islands where shark fishing was present. Now, this is obviously a shark swimming on a reef, and to me, one of the saddest things about my time on that island is that for the duration I was there, I never saw a shark swimming in the water. I only ever saw a shark at the end of the line or right about to be finned on land. Uh, whereas other islands, you'd hop in the water and within minutes you'd see a shark. So the same island chain, uh, there was Christmas Island, for instance. On the back side, I jumped in the water to go snorkeling, and within two minutes, there was three sharks coming around that were interested. And then the island I did my research at that had a larger human population in a smaller area, never got to see one for the entire duration. Uh, this, to me, um, raises interesting questions about connectivity of shark populations across that island chain. So that's something that we're currently looking at with a shark tagging program where about 1,100 gray reef sharks have been tagged 
in one of those islands, and we threw some satellite tags on them as well to see how far their movements through the island chain might go. Um, and that is part of the general concept that these resources, that resources aka sharks, uh, that are currently being lost by this destructive fishing practice is really not limited or owned to a single island and is very much so a shared commodity of ours. And what is disheartening is that um, our global or Western influences are causing a loss of that resource. Um, and so moving forward in the future, I think that one of the main things I'll be focusing on for my graduate work right now, so I'm starting off a PhD, is uh, trying to assess and develop more sustainable fisheries for small-scale subsistence-based islands like this one. Uh, specifically, I'm pretty interested in the use of FADs or fish aggregating devices uh, in the near shore system. FADs are something that receive a lot of uh, justified uh, critiques because in industrial fisheries, they can really increase the amount that a fishery can catch and make it very exploitive on a small time scale. But for these smaller subsistence fisheries, they may help islands survive. And that's an overview of what I did and will hope to do. fisheries management of any sort that's happening. So the only rules on the islands where I was working uh, were that, you know, don't catch, the island elders of that island would pretty much set guidelines, but it only re really reflected don't catch dolphins and don't catch too many turtles. Um, and so I don't think the solution is to ban shark finning in these waters because I don't think it will be enforced. Uh, it's certainly a much more complicated issue resolve, uh, much more complicated issue that mainly is driven by global demand. And so what's been really effective is some uh, advertising and marketing campaigns that have occurred in China, in Hong Kong, the epicenter of the demand, where they've been really successful actually in limiting Chinese demand for shark fins, which is always going to be more productive than trying to cut off the supply chain of an area as diffuse as the Pacific. Um, to follow up on that, is their economy now dependent on what they receive from shark finning, or is it possible for them to go 